Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about matrices and abstract linear maps. And indeed, in this part 51, we will talk about the determinant for linear maps. In other words, we will lift the notion of the determinant from the concrete level of matrices to the abstract level of linear maps. However, you already know, before we do that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube, via PayPal or by other means. This is needed, since only because of your support this video course here is possible. And as the common thank you, you can download the PDF version and the quiz for this video with the link in the description. Okay, then let's immediately start by recalling what we already know about the connection of matrices and linear maps. So for example, if you have a matrix A, you can always define a linear map. In fact, this connection works for all matrices, however, here we will only consider square matrices. This means then that for the linear map, the input space is the same as the output space. So the vector space Rn goes in and Rn comes out. Now, this linear map is called Fa and it's defined by sending the vector x to the vector Ax. So you see, we just have the common matrix vector multiplication. And now you should already know, because we have learned it in part 20, that it also works the other way around. This means, more precisely, that a linear map also induces a matrix. In fact, we find exactly one well-defined matrix A with the property that Fa is equal to F. Moreover, also in part 20, we have learned how we can calculate this matrix A. Indeed, in the columns of A, we find the images of the canonical unit vectors under F. In other words, you could say it's the image of the unit cube. So maybe as a reminder, let's write it down. So first here in the first column, we have the image of E1. And there I don't have to tell you that E1 is the vector that has only zeros except at the first component where there is a 1. And then we continue this whole procedure with E2, E3 and so on until we have F of En in the end. So in fact we see in this case we have a square matrix. Therefore you should know at this point we can also bring the determinant into the game. For this let's sketch the unit cube here on the left hand side. Of course this should be the unit cube in Rn but it's easier to visualize that only in R2. In particular unit cube means that we find the canonical unit vectors here. So in the picture we could say this is E1 and this is E2. And then you know in general we would have all the vectors here until En. However in all cases we know that the n-dimensional volume of the unit cube is exactly 1. And that's even the case if we put orientation to the volume as we have done it in the past. Ok, and now the linear map F acts on this unit cube. By definition we know it sends vectors from Rn to vectors in Rn again. And since F is a linear map, we already know not a lot can happen, only stretching, rotating or reflecting. So for example, the new figure could look like this, where this is the vector f of e1. So it's the first column of our matrix A. And then the second column we find here, and so on in general in Rn. However, now the question is, what is the orientated volume of this new figure here on the right hand side? And that's something we have already discussed a lot, because it's a parallel epipet and the volume is given by the determinant of A. Of course, we still talk about the general n-dimensional volume. So in summary, we could say the determinant of A tells us how much the volume of the unit cube is changed by the linear map F. And I would say this is such an important fact that we can immediately write that down. So in one sentence we say determinant of A gives the relative change of volume caused by the linear map Fa. Of course, for the moment we only have that for the unit cube, but we can generalize that soon. 
However, before we do that, I would say this sentence here gives rise to the next definition. Indeed, this is the abstract definition of the determinant. This means that we can take any abstract linear map from Rn into Rn and then we can define the determinant of f. So from now on, it makes sense to put a linear map f into the determinant function. And now it should not be a surprise that we use our determinant function for matrices in order to define this new determinant function. And indeed, the assignment is very simple. We can just use determinant of a because a was uniquely defined by f. So please don't forget, a is simply given by the images of the canonical unit vectors. And with that, we can translate everything we know from determinants of matrices to determinants of linear maps. So for example, for the multiplication rule, we now have to consider compositions of linear maps. So more precisely, we would have the composition f after g inside the determinant function. And then we know we can simply write it as a product of two determinants. In fact, this follows immediately from the multiplication rule for the determinants of matrices. But now on this abstract level, this is also something we can use. Okay, then let's go back to the application, because we already know that we can use the determinant to calculate volume changes. And indeed, it turns out that we can use that also for figures that are not the unit cube. So for example, we could consider a shape that looks like an F. However, of course, the question is not how it looks, but if we can define a well-defined n-dimensional volume for this figure. And here we see it's not a problem at all, because we can split it up into rectangles. And indeed, we have finitely many, and then we can just sum up the volumes of the rectangles. And a similar thing we could do in higher dimensions. And in general, you could also say, maybe we can do an approximation with hypercubes. But no matter how we do it, in the end, the volume has to be well defined. And then as before, the question is, what happens if we apply a linear map f? Then we know this map can stretch, rotate and reflect the figure and then we get something new here. So the whole thing is not too crazy because it's a linear map, so lines on the left hand side are also lines on the right hand side. More precisely, the worst thing that can happen is that a line collapses to one dot. However, this is not happening here, we still get out a non-vanishing volume on the right hand side. Ok, and now we can use that the linear map has the corresponding matrix A. And now the question is, how does the volume change from left to right? So let's call the whole volume on the left hand side simply vol of f, volume of the figure f. Ok, and now we already know from before that if we consider just one rectangle, it's scaled by the determinant of A. So in other words, each rectangle here on the right hand side has in volume one factor determinant of A. In other words, the volume of the whole figure is also scaled by the determinant of A. So therefore please remember here, the volume change is simply a factor. And indeed, in this factor, also the orientation change is included. And there you already know, this is simply given by the sign of the determinant. So in summary here, you should remember that the change of volume for a linear map is also a linear function. In fact, it's just scaling the volume function by a factor given by the determinant of A. This means, for example, if you have a determinant that is equal to 1, then the linear map does not change the volume, so it only rotates the figure. So there you should see the determinant is a very important concept, also if you deal with very complicated figures in Rn. As long as you can define an n-dimensional volume of it, you can calculate the volume change under linear maps. Ok, and then I would say, let's close the topic of determinants in the next video. So I really hope that I see you there and have a nice day. Bye!